Now, go to Acts chapter 5. Now you say, well, they, they probably learned their lesson there in Acts chapter 4, right? No. Acts chapter 5, they're back at it again. Um, they get thrown in jail this time. And the Lord comes and actually breaks them out of prison. Get a hold of that one, too. The Lord actually busts out the apostles from jail. Now, can you imagine a modern-day independent fundamental Baptist having that happen? Jail doors come flying open. They say, Lord, I, I'm kind of waiting on my lawyer. Um, you know, because we have the Christian Law Association. And uh, I'm going to be waiting here. And, and uh, we're going to get a petition signed so I can get out of prison. Because I don't want to go out of jail right now. Because after all, I'd be hunted down as an outlaw and a criminal. The Lord says, yeah, I know. Go on out there and preach. Well, Lord, I just, I, I don't think I could yet, you know. Acts chapter 5, verse 25 says, Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. There's that council again. And the high, the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Something interesting there. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Acts, verse, Acts chapter 5, verse 38. Jump down there. Okay, they go, they have this council, and they all go out, and they're like, What are we going to do to these guys? What are we going to do? You know, And Gamaliel, who actually had taught Paul, stands up and he says, you know, this is what we should do. Now, this, this here is key, brethren, okay? This thing you got to get. This thing you got to get worked out in your mind. This is a key fundamental of the faith, okay? Acts chapter 5, verse 38 and 39. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. It'll come to nothing. Verse 39, but if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Or they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Verse 41, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Now, if you know your church history, what happens is, at first they were saying, we'll just beat them, throw them in prison, just kind of whatever. And towards the end of the first century, that's when the, you know, they, the martyrdom, actually Acts chapter 7 is the first martyr, Stephen. But it gets worse and worse from then. And because they can't rationalize with these Christians, they start to murder them and torture them. And that lasted for thousands of years okay it lasted from the first century the whole way up until probably into the 1800s i know that there was actually some stuff about the catholics persecuting you know greek orthodox people which i don't really consider greek orthodox people to be saved but you know because they're kind of like catholicism another branch of it um but you know they were persecuting greek orthodox people over in Ser in uh, serbia in like 2001 so um there's still persecution that goes on. There's still Christians being tortured by the Roman Catholic system. Uh, but it's going to reach its full height in the time of Jacob's trouble, which is coming. There, at that point in time, you're going to have Bible believers being executed. You say, well, then you're worried about that? No, because I'm going to be leaving before that time happens. Before the time of Jacob's trouble, we're going to be leaving, if you're a Bible-believing Christian. If uh, somebody gets saved after that point in time, they believe the wrong doctrine or whatever, they, it's not that they refused the truth. They didn't, you know, go against the truth, like it says there in Second Thessalonians chapter two. Uh, it isn't that, okay? It's that these you did you never heard the truth, and the rapture happens. You go, oh no, I know what that was, and you know, then you get saved. You'll be executed in that time. So it's going to come back. We're heading right back into that same, you know, not just persecution verbally, but we're actually heading into a a physical persecution. Okay. Um, but now let me ask you another question. 
how many of these independent fundamental church buildings have come to naught? You know, it said there, if this work of this council be of men, it'll come to naught. Right? Now that's just logical. If something is of men, it comes to nothing. If it's of God, you can't overthrow it. See? Here we have on the left, Temple Baptist Church and, uh, in Detroit, Michigan. This was pastored by Dr. J. Frank Norris and Buchamp Vick. Okay, and these two guys were the ones that had this huge big church there. And at the time, in the, in the heyday of it, they had 10,000 members. Guess what? It came to naught. Here's a picture of it today. It's abandoned. Windows broken out, graffiti painted on it and stuff like that. A 10,000 member church building and it's dead within 60 or 70 years after it was in its heyday. What's going on there? Well, it was of men. And I want to tell you right now, and this is probably going to be the subject for a future study. It's, it's going to be another big one um, because I'm finding out a lot of stuff about it. And again, a lot of this stuff gets covered up by the brethren and it's quite hypocritical to be very honest with you. But a lot of these big name preachers of the past were members of the Masonic Lodge. And you look into the Masons, what were the Masons? What was their main thing since they've been founded? They build cathedrals and church buildings. Huh. Protestant church buildings. And, you know, the area that I was born and raised in, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, has some of the oldest uh, church buildings, some old, old, old ones from the 1600s, actually. And uh, a lot of this stuff is based on Masons. And we actually have a lodge here in uh, Pennsylvania that's actually Lodge Number 666. And uh, so we're going to do some traveling, and uh, we're going to get some pictures, we're going to get some video of this stuff. And uh, there's definitely a tie-in with the Masonic Lodge and a lot of these giant church buildings. Could it be that that's why you have obelisks on top? You know, the steeple? Because if you see obelisks in a graveyard, it's a mason. Because, see, the Masonic doctrine is, and again, here we go, more stuff that you cover your children's ears. The Masonic doctrine is that the rebirth there, that their resurrection, is symbolized by the male phallus. Okay? I'm not going to get into more of that. You can figure that out on your own. If you're married, you understand that the phallus goes down and comes back up. All right? And that's what the Masons believe. That's why they wear the apron with the square and compass down here and the G covering that particular organ, their phallus. Because see, G in the Masonic Lodge does not stand for God. It does not stand for geometry. It stands for generativity. How do you generate new children with a certain organ that is worshipped by priests of Baal? And they build their pagan temples and put the obelisk on top. And God looks down and he says, that's an abomination. Read through the Old Testament sometimes. See what God was telling the children of Israel to do to the priests of Baal. See what God thinks of the priests of Baal, of Baal worship. And then tell me how God is blessing your building and how your building is called the house of God. Tell me about it. But what's another reason for church buildings? What was the point of them building these church buildings back in the late 1600s, early 1700s? Why did Christians that held to believers' baptism, they call them Baptists, you know, but they weren't really Baptists. They didn't call themselves that. But why did they all of a sudden feel this need, you know, now there's religious freedom. Why did all of a sudden now they say, oh, we have to have these buildings? Well, another reason is for credibility with the lost world. Now, I scanned this picture in here. This is page 543, The Law of Public ed Education by E. Edmund Ruder, Jr. and Robert R. Hamilton, copyright 1970, the Foundation Press, Incorporated. And it says here, quote, The Massachusetts Vaccination Statute 
provided exemption from the general immunization requirement for school admission of those presenting an affidavit, affidavit from a church official that vaccination conflicts with the tenets and practices of a, now look at this, recognized church or religious denomination. Recognized church? You mean a state church? A creature of the state? Well, brother, independent fundamental Baptist churches are not recognized by the state. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. You're a state church. You're just like everybody else. And the parent is a member in good standing. You have to be a member in a good standing of your denomination. One who was not a member of a church was thus unable to get exemption. An exemption. So in other words, if I'd come along and I'd say, hey, my son or my daughter uh, here don't have children yet, but I'm saying for the purpose of it. I come along and I say, I don't want my son or daughter here to be vaccinated because I have religious beliefs that are contrary to that. According to this law book of public education, they would say, oh, what church are you a member of? Well, I'm part of the church of Jesus Christ. And they say, oh, of Latter-day Saints. I say, no, the, I'm not a lost Mormon on my way to hell. No, I'm a, a member of the church of Jesus Christ, the, the church of Christ in the Bible. I'm a New Testament Christian. They'd say, oh, okay, what denomination? I'm a New Testament Christian. I don't have a church building. I worship at home or out in the fields or out in the forest. They'd say, sorry, no exemption. But if I would come and I'd say, I'm a member of First Baptist Church, Hammond, Indiana. You know, I don't know who's pastor there now, you know, because Jack Scapp's in prison, but uh, whoever's the pastor there now, you know, I'll get a note from him and I'll prove it. They'd say, oh, great, sounds good. Why? They're recognized by the government. Continuing here, it says, The Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts ruled the provision to be unconstitutional because it favored those who belonged to recognized churches over those who sincerely held religious beliefs but did not belong to churches. Good for them. You know, it is unconstitutional to say you have to be part of a recognized, state-approved church building. Okay? But of course, this stuff is already there in the paperwork. It's already being legislated. So as time goes by, it's going to become law. You're going to have to be part of a recognized, state-approved church building. And IFB churches are. But now let's look here at 1 Samuel chapter 8. You can turn there in your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 8. This is a very interesting thing. 1 Samuel 8, I'm going to start here at verse 1. It says here, And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Then the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes, kind of like some of the uh, IFB pastors, and perverted judgment, very much like some of the IFB pastors. 1 Samuel verse, chapter 8, verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Hmm. Make us a king to judge us like all the nations. They want to be like everybody else. Kind of like the uh, independent believers back then, the Christians, the Church of Christ back in the late 1600s. They looked and they said, oh, we have religious freedom now. We have protection. We can do our own thing. Let's have church buildings like everybody else. Hmm. Verse 6. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Very interesting. You see, if you're out here in nature and if you just say, I don't go to church buildings, I am a member of the church of Jesus Christ, I, I, I don't go to church, I am the church, you know, and you say, I deal directly with God. I don't have to have a pastor above me ruling and reigning over me telling me what to do. I can learn from men that preach. That's fine, you know. And if we come together in, as the saints, we look to the older men of the church there that know the Bible well, you know, We'll look to them to have the oversight. You know, that's fine. But I don't need to go to some building someplace. See, I deal directly with God. 
That's the way it's supposed to be. But these early believers, they started to say, we want to be just like everybody else. We want to have that recognition of having a church building. We don't want God to rule over us. We'll have man rule over us. Verse 8, According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day wherewith they have forsaken, forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Very interesting there. The people served gods like Mammon, and they wanted to worship the Lord in pagan temples. And that's exactly what they did. You study the thing out. You have King Saul, then you have King David, then King Solomon. What did Solomon do? Bought, he brought pagan deities into the temple that he built. This miraculous, beautiful temple. And he built this place and brought the pagan idols right into it. You see, whenever you build a building and you say, this is where you go to meet God, it's very easy to replace God, the God of heaven, with the gods of the world. You know, the table of devils, the cup of devils, you can't serve the Lord and devils. The Gentiles sacrifice things to devils. See? Incredible. 1 Samuel 8, verse 9 through 11 says, Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. Interesting, because the modern day IFB system, they take the sons of the people and send them off to the seminaries. Send them off to the Bible universities. Hmm. So they can go out and start other church buildings. Local churches, you know. Verse 12. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties and will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. It's interesting because the big mega churches need all sorts of business positions like treasurer, secretary, all these different positions. Why? Why? Well, you if you're running, you know, 10,000 people in your church building... You can't do it all by yourself. You can't have a one-man show. So you have to have all these positions that appear nowhere in the pages of the King James Bible. Hmm. Why? Because you're doing it just like the Catholics do it. Just like the Protestants do it. Just like the world. Here's another interesting one. 1 Samuel 8, verse 13. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries, and to be cooks, and to be bakers. Did you ever hear of bake sales? To raise money at the Baptist church buildings? Hmm. Wonder why. Well, probably because of the same reason why Lutherans have bake sales and the same reason why Methodists have bake sales and spaghetti dinners and Catholics have bake sales and spaghetti dinners and fish night and whatever else. Hmm. 1 Samuel verse, chapter 8, verse 14 and 15. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. All those people he sets up in his building structure. And check this out. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. Now tell me this is just coincidental. I don't believe in coincidence. Okay? This is, this is showing what happens when a church building or when a, when a group of Christians builds a church building. The pastor takes a tenth of your harvest, your paycheck. Why? Well, he's got his staff to pay. He's got the mortgage to pay. He's got the heat bill. He's got the electric bill. He's got the air conditioning in the summer. We've got to put new carpet in this place. What's he doing? He's taking a tenth of your harvest. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 16, And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. Verse 17, He will take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants. Did you ever hear the thing? You better be in church every time the doors are open. If you don't, you are unfaithful. I had that thing put on me numerous times. You know, I was, I was just starting King James Video Ministries and I was going to a, a big Baptist phallus house uh, here in the area. And uh, I was going there. 
And it was just like, you know, a couple times I went and I did something other than coming to the services there, you know. And, and the pastor actually told a, a friend of mine, he said, uh, Brian's unfaithful to the church, you know, <laughs> because I missed a few services. I was there all the time, and I missed like three services in a couple months. But I was unfaithful. What was going on there? Well, you see, we have to be like everybody else. We have to have our church building, and you have to be my servant. You give up your life to come in here and serve your local church. Hey, can you clean this month? Are you going to be able to come in? Are you going to be able to cook for the fellowship dinner? Are you going to be able to come? Hey, we need somebody to do the lawn. You know, could you, could you do the landscaping? I mean, uh, do you have any skill in, in roofing? Because we've got to get a new roof on the, on the one wing of the church building there. And uh, we've got to have somebody clean the steeple. You know, could you clean the toilets? Could you, could you come in and clean the nursery? If you don't, you're unfaithful. What's going on? He takes a tenth from the sheep and he says, you're going to be my servants. Mm -hmm. Verse 18, And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Interesting today because even though we have more independent fundamental Baptist churches in America right now and in other countries, we have more of them now than at any time in history, that should produce stronger Christians, shouldn't it? But it doesn't. It produces weaker Christians. The people that go to these church buildings, they have problems all the time. I've been there. I've preached to them. I've talked to them. I've fellowshiped with them. I've gone to their houses. I know them. I'm not a liberal. I'm not some liberal Democrat that goes to some community worship center or something like that. I've been in the independent fundamental Baptist movement. Don't talk to me about it. Okay? Verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Hmm. Just like a lot of you are doing right now, if you've even made it this far, you're saying to yourself, you're saying right now, Hey, I don't care what you say, Brian, I will have a church building. And I will have a pastor to go out and fight my battles for me. You know, you have somebody that you have to deal with at work, and instead of you looking up the answers, you say, I'll have you talk to my pastor. Um, hey, pastor, could you talk to my family? Could you talk to my friends? Could you talk? You have a pastor that goes out and fights your battles, don't you? Mm hmm. You rebel. I'm not the rebel. You're the rebel because you're rebelling against the book. See, the qualifications for a rebel are, do you line up with the book? And if you don't line up with the book, you're the one that has the problem, not me. I rebel against your stupid system that comes from the world, that comes from Catholicism, that comes from pagans. Okay? That's what I rebel against. I'm not a rebel against the Word of God. You're the rebel. 1 Samuel 8 verse 21 and Samuel heard all the words of the people and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord and the Lord said to Samuel hearken unto their voice and make them a king and Samuel said unto the men of Israel go ye every man into his city unto his city excuse me Christians in the 17th and 18th, 18th centuries wanted to have pagan buildings to meet in so they could look like everybody else they got what they wanted and the Lord is now forsaking this land You know, I heard something very interesting years ago, and I've often thought about it. We often talk about the great apostasy in these last days being a result of the modern churches. Um, how could you have modern lost professing Christians fall away from something where they were never at? Okay? You can't have a lost person apostatize from the Lord because they were never right with the Lord. You know what I've grown to believe the great apostasy is in these falling or these last days, the great falling away that's mentioned there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? You know what I believe it is? I believe it's Bible-believing Christians meeting in pagan temples. 
and all the spiritual problems that come along with that. Why do you think so many of these, as I said earlier, why do you think so many independent fundamental Baptist pastors have problems with adultery? I've known a couple of them. And they're good family men. They're, they're loving and loyal to their wife. And all of a sudden you hear a couple years later, they've divorced, they're running around with some other woman, their family's busted up. Why? Probably because they're meeting in a Parthenon with a phallus on top. And God looks down and he says, can't help you. Sorry. And they're down there going, God, give us souls for our hire. Build the church back up to the glory days. And, uh, and the Lord's down there going, do you hear anything? I didn't hear anything. I'm not going to listen to you. Get out of that building, then we'll talk. Back to the article. How about Roger Williams? Quote, Williams graduated from Cambridge University in 1627 and was apparently ordained in the Church of England. He soon embraced separatist ideas and decided to leave England. In 1631, he arrived in Boston. He was much displeased with the Puritan theocracy. He strongly believed in separation of church and state and upheld the principles of soul liberty. Soul liberty is a belief that everyone is responsible to God individually. It bases its belief in the New Testament teaching that every believer is a priest to himself, having full access to God without the need to go, need to go through a church, church leader, or priest. And he gives some scriptures here, Hebrews 4, verses 15 through 16, 10, 19 through 22. Despite his views, he was made the pastor of the church in Salem. Shortly after that, because of his doctrinal preaching, he was forced to leave Salem and went for a short time to Plymouth. He returned to Salem where he was summoned by for, before the court in Boston because of his outspoken beliefs and was banished from the colony. I can relate to that one. <laughs> you know, I've gone uh, to Baptist, independent Baptist churches and I went, you know, went into the house church movement and then I went back to an independent fundamental Baptist church and because of my heretical beliefs, we were banished <laughs> from the colony, my wife and I. Praise the Lord, you know, wonderful. Um... Continuing here, the charge recorded against him, and by the way, we've been excommunicated by the brethren up there. So, you know, tough apples, see you at the judgment seat of Christ. The charge recorded against him was that he broached and divulged new and dangerous opinions against the authority of the magistrates. Oh boy. Notice it wasn't against the authority of Scripture, it was the magistrates. Traditions and doctrines of men. Clearly, he was banished because he believed in religious freedom and believed and taught the New Testament was a believer's sole source for faith and practice. That's what I believe. His crime was that he rejected the unbiblical ideas of the state church, such as infant baptism and other false teachings of the Puritans. The Puritans drove him from their colony in the dead of winter. It should be noted that at first, Williams did not identify himself as a Baptist. Williams didn't say, I'm a Baptist. I'm an independent fundamental Baptist preacher. He didn't say that. However, he continued to read the New Testament and became, became fully aware that infant baptism, sprinkling for baptism, and allowing unsaved people to be members of the church was not scriptural. Thus, resolving to follow the Lord's commands in truth, in March 1639, he formed the first, or he formed the Baptist Church in Providence, Rhode Island. Didn't call himself a Baptist, but he formed a Baptist church. See the, see the slant here that this guy has? The prejudice? It's ridiculous. He began by baptizing himself, which is not biblical baptism. Why not? I don't really get that either. He then baptized ten others who became the members of his church. Shortly afterward, Williams withdrew from the church and became what he called a seeker. History does not record why he would not identify himself as a Baptist, although he set up a Baptist church. Again, in the beginning, he didn't call himself a Baptist. When he left that system, he didn't call himself a Baptist. But he set up a Baptist church. What? You see you see the, the lying here and the deceit of this guy who's a Baptist historian? This is lying. This is deception. Roger Williams didn't call himself a Baptist, but he set up a Baptist church. Later, he wasn't a Baptist, but it was a Baptist. Yeah. Please note that this presents no problem for the first Baptist church in America. This church was not founded on a man, but on the Bible. Um, <laughs> well, I hate to tell you, but the, the, the church group that Roger Williams set up actually apostatized and got a building later on. 
But let's continue. Um, you know, apparently, according to this author, anyone who believes in believer's baptism was automatically classified as a Baptist. John Smith was not a Baptist, and Roger Williams was not a Baptist in the modern-day sense of the word. No, they weren't. Yes, they believed in baptizing a believer, an older, an adult of their own free will, but that did not mean that they were called Baptists. Continuing with the article here, quote, The sole authority for any true church is God's word and not its human founder or its heritage. Not once in the New Testament do you find even a hint that a church was legitimate because it was founded by Paul, was established by the church of Jerusalem or Antioch, or called itself by a particular name. This guy has a good tendency of shooting himself in the foot. He says, not once in the New Testament do you see a church called by a particular name. Bless God, we're Baptists. You just contradicted yourself, buddy. However, no one should think uh, little of the name of Baptist, for it is the name that most has identified these individuals and churches that have uncompromisingly stood on the word of God. Historically, Baptists are the only group in modern times whose churches were founded on the scriptures alone and not on the traditions or works of some men. Total lie. Baptists have always been the champions of the word of God and preaching of the gospel. History is clear. There is no other denomination that has so loved and been faithful to God's word as have the Baptists. Another outright, outright lie. And we will continue to demonstrate this. Now, when was the very first Baptist church building built in America? Now, you go to firstbaptistchurchinamerica.org. I have the link right there. And it says, quote, The first Baptist church in America, Williams soon gathered the faithful in regular worship in his home. Roger Williams met in his home. Holding services several times a week. After about two years, the little congregation became the first Baptist church in the New World. Williams concluded that believer's baptism was the only valid concept of baptism. Since he and all his congregation had been baptized as infants in late 1638, he had himself rebaptized and then he rebaptized his flock. However, Williams' spiritual journey did not end here. Within months, he came to doubt that any existing institution could validly call itself the church. He concluded that the church had died with the Roman Emperor Theodosius, uh, had made Christianity the state religion of the Roman uh, or, sorry, of the empire around 385 AD. He believed that all the rites and practices of the church had become invalid and corrupt. So in the summer of 1639, he resigned. But he cherished the belief to the end of his long life, 1683, that the church that he planted was based on scripture. He remained steadfast in his defense of religious freedom, and his influence caused Rhode Island to be a unique haven of religious liberty in the 17th century. The Baptist Church lived on under the eldership of elders ordained from its ranks from 1639 to 1771. They had no meeting house until 1700. Huh. So for from 1638 the whole way to 1700, they had no meeting house. Well then, they weren't really independent fundamental Baptists in the modern sense of the word. No, they weren't. They were more like what we do, house church Christians. Um, in that year, the pastor Pardon Tillinghast erected a tiny building on a 20 by 20 foot lot he owned on North Main Street. This soon proved to be inadequate as the church grew, so a second meeting house measuring 40 by 40 feet was erected next door to the first one. Providence continued to grow through the 18th century and the Great Awakening increased the number of Baptists all over New England. Finally, the present meeting house was built. Its size and beauty indicated that the direction of Baptist work in Providence had come under the leadership of James Manning. Okay. Now below is an excerpt from a book entitled A, Law, a Little Journey to the Home of Elder Pardon Tillinghast. This is page 13. It says here, quote, According to its early records, the membership, or I'm sorry, the members at first met in a grove unless the weather was wet and stormy when they assembled in private houses. For over 60 years, the church had no meeting house of its own, although there were no fewer than 3,000 people scattered over Providence in the year 1700, mostly Baptists and Quakers. Over 3,000 people scattered around there, and yet they didn't meet in church buildings? Huh. You see, one of the big arguments for modern-day church buildings, they say, you know, 
well, how could you fit, you know, 200 people into a house? Well, why don't you fit them into the outdoors? We could fit a few hundred people here, you know. And you say, what happens if it starts to rain? Um, you don't have one pastor up there putting on a show and a performance that everybody's traveled miles around to come and see. You have multiple elders. And there's multiple elders say, I'll take this group here. We'll go into this house over there and we'll teach them. Teach them the word of God. We'll pray. We'll read the Bible together. See, that's how the thing works. Multiple elders, not a one man putting on a show. And you say, great, amen, brother. You take those guys, you take these guys, you'll take these guys. And you go. You meet together in the woods, in the fields. When you have to meet in houses, you split up. It's that simple. You say, is that New Testament practice? Yes. That's the New Testament practice. You say, well, uh, how, how do we license ourselves when we do that? How do we make sure that we're legally doing this by the government? You don't. Um, did you legally get the government's permission to eat your breakfast this morning? No. Do you have to legally get the government's permission to read the Bible? No. Not yet, anyhow. What do you do? There are certain things that the Lord tells you to do, and you don't need man's permission to do it. Here's how this thing works, brethren. Bible. Man. God. God tells man about the Bible. I don't need Bible, man, government, God. And actually with 501c3, it's Bible, man, God, government. And that's wrong. It's wicked. But now, you say, well, how did this money come about to build this first Baptist church here in America, this part in Tillinghast? How did he raise the funds? Where did this come from? Was this the contributions of Bible-believing Christians and, and praise God, the Lord provided the money so that we could build this great house of God and worship the Lord in spirit and in truth? Is that what happened? Historic Shrines of America, page 82. Again, this is all scanned into the PDF here, folks. All right, don't tell me I'm lying. It's right there. You can look it up. Quote, when the building was planned, the, uh, when the building was planned, the Charitable Baptist Society was incorporated, incorporated, that it might hold title to a meeting house for the public worship of Almighty God and to hold commencement in. Nearly a third of the $7,000 required for the new building was raised by a lottery authorized by the state. The architects modeled the church after the popular St. Martin's in the Field in London, whose designer was James Gibbs, a pupil of Sir Christopher Wren, and the 200-foot spire, steeple, obelisk, you know, was hung the bell made in London, on which were inscribed the strange words, for freedom of conscience this town was first planted, persuasion not force was used by the people. This church is the eldest and has not recanted, enjoying and granting bell, temple, and steeple. So you have a pagan temple with an obelisk built on top, financed by a state-approved lottery. Oh, praise God for the Baptist heritage in America. <laughs> I don't think so. God forgive us for the independent fundamental Baptist movement in America. God have mercy on us for that wicked system. The beliefs and doctrines of the early people that they call Baptists now, those beliefs and doctrines are very similar to what we do here. What Bible-believing Christians do that don't go to the pagan buildings. This modern-day independent fundamental Baptist church movement is based on paganism and Catholicism. And right there is your heritage. The oldest Baptist church building in America was built by a state-approved lottery. But it gets worse. Read you two scriptures here. Proverbs 13, verse 11. Wealth, got, wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. Proverbs 28, verse 22 says, He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. So, in other words, if you finance the building of your church building with the state-approved lottery... That's a problem. 
continuing here, firstbaptistchurchinamerica.org. It says here, the meeting house built in 1774 to 1775 was the largest building project in New England at that time. The building 80 by 80 feet seated 1,200 people, equal to one third of Providence population then. The construction was greatly aided by the fact that the British had closed the port, port of Boston as punishment for the Boston Tea Party. Um, many shipwrights and carpenters were thrown out of work and came to Providence to build the meeting house. Wonder how many of them were masons. The structure was dedicated in May 1775 and the 18 or 185 foot steeple was added shortly thereafter. This was the first Baptist meeting house in New England to have a steeple. The steeple went up in three and a half days and it has survived time and hurricanes since then. Yeah, I bet. The architecture is a blend of English, Georgian, and the traditional New England meeting house style. The Georgian aspects borrowed from Anglican church designs include the exterior portico and steeple and many interior elements such as the Palladian window behind the high pulpit, the fluted Tuscan, or Tuscan, Tuscan columns. In other words, like the Greeks. The groined arches in the balcony and the split uh, pediments over the doors, all of this was super, superimposed on a plain New England meeting house with its white walls, cla clear glass windows, dominant pulpit, and lack of any religious symbols. The iconoclastic Baptists regarded all symbols, even the cross, as icons and idols. A grand chandelier from Waterford, Ireland was added in 1792. All right. In the 19th century, the auditorium underwent underwent many, many changes, including new pews, adding an organ and interior baptistry. Several gas chandeliers, painted ceilings, and in addition to the rear of the building was a memorial stained glass window. Now check this out. In 1957, former member John D. Rockefeller Jr. made a gift to enable the church to restore the meeting house mostly to its original appearance. Today, the meeting house, a national historic landmark building, is regarded as one of the most, one of the must-see places in Providence for anyone interested in American architecture. What a nice church member. John D. Rockefeller Jr., member of the Illuminati, high-level Mason. Why would he be interested in going to that first Baptist church? Huh, probably because it's a pagan temple. Back to the article, quote, however, after independence was won and the Constitution and Bill of Rights was written, we gave all Americans religious freedom the Baptists again began to grow until today they are the largest denominational group in the United States. Now, how do Baptist churches grow? Well, if you know anything about them, if you've gone to them, they grow through splits and divisions. Here we have locally, we have Liberty Baptist Church started out, Jack Hiles used to come there actually, and Jerry Falwell. It split and it created Mount Zion Baptist Church, Liberty Baptist Church, and Berean Bible Church. And there might be other ones that I don't know about, but I know that those you know, three are here now because of a split. And I guarantee you, over and over and over again, the reason Baptist churches grow is because they're splitting all the time. All the time. Strife, contention, division. All the time. Back to the article. Quote, What makes a true Baptist? If the following five distinctives are the beliefs of a church, then you will have a true Baptist church. If a church cannot answer in the positive to each of these distinctives, then you do not have a New Testament or Baptist church. If they identify themselves as Baptists, they are misusing the name. Okay? The five Baptist distinctives. Number one, we accept only the New Testament as our authority in all matters of faith and practice. Okay? All Baptist churches are there for disqualified. They do not accept the New Testament as their final authority in all matters of faith and practice. So all modern day independent fundamental Baptist church buildings are all immediately disqualified. And I'm not going to read all this. You can get on here, but they go down through and they say, we do not accept any authority over the New Testament church, but Christ himself. Again, that's a lie. They accept the government. And I didn't write out all these things. The third one there, it says, we believe in strict separation of church and state. Um, no power on earth is higher than God's word, and a church should not be in any way yoked or controlled by the state or any civil authority in religious matters. Again, they've disqualified themselves. If they're 501c3, automatically they're disqualified. And even if they're not 501c3, they're still subject to building codes and, and practices and things like that. They're still subject to the law. See? That's the problem when you have a building and you call it a church. And they're based on pagan architecture. 
God can't bless the system. Concluding remarks from this article. Quote, a church which cannot answer yes to all of these questions cannot historically call itself a Baptist church, nor can it legitimately call itself a New Testament church. These are the distinctives that separate true Baptists from all Protestants, any organized church, doctrinally unsound church, or Christian cults. Well, sorry, the Baptists are disqualified then. Okay, uh, then he goes and he says, a person can rightly take godly pride in truthfully bearing the name Baptist. Now listen to the sermon I just preached on pride, the sin of pride. It's a, it's a sin. I'm not going to cover the scriptures here because I think my battery is just about dead. So what have we learned from this study? Number one, early Baptists like Roger Williams, John Smith, Thomas Helwes, etc. never actually called themselves by the name of Baptist. Number two, no early believers met in buildings until around the year 1700. Number three, the first Baptist church building in America was financed by a state-approved lottery and later funded by John D. Rockefeller, Jr. Number four, most Baptist churches building, buildings today are the result of splits and division, and they are pagan temples with phalluses on them. Okay, while they claim to be not Protestant, they practice, their practices come from Roman Catholicism, and we will demonstrate this in the next study. Okay, I'm going to talk about the Catholic Catechism and how Baptist practices line up with it and not with the Bible. Finally, in closing, Proverbs chapter 21, verse 16, an admonition to all the Baptists out there, the man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. Amen. See you in the next study.